You know, the, the Bible tells us that one of the most powerful things that we have as believers is our testimony. It's how we got where we're at. It's how we became followers of Christ. And sometimes in Christian culture, we can be saved so long that we lose our thankfulness. And uh, I, I believe it's important to connect and reconnect with how you came to know Christ. And not a day goes by that I don't wake up and look in the mirror and wonder why did you pick me? Why, I've, been, I've been traveling full-time for 18 years now. I'm 44. I've been traveling for 18 years full-time. And I'm not kidding. A day does not go by that I don't look up to heaven and go, man, I'm an epic failure. Like, why did you pick broken me to do this? But God has a plan. And so I'm going to tell you how I came to know Christ this morning. And I'm going to bring you on a journey. I'm going to let you inside my brain and pray to Jesus you can find your way out. <laughs> Amen? I know. How can he have such nice, clean kicks and such a dirty past? Well, <laughs> bow your heads. I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for every person that's in this room, God, that people are not here by accident or happenstance. Uh, maybe some were guilted in. Lord, we'll take it. Lord, whatever it took to get people in this room, Father, we thank you for your divine plan. Father, we thank you that um, people don't have to be the religious model they think. They can be totally different. God, and we just thank you for your real romance that you started on Calvary. God, that you picked us. We didn't pick you. I pray that we would touch something eternal this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So my mom and dad um, actually met and got married in Seattle, Washington. Yeah, <laughs> a few people like that. Um, the rest are Republicans. Um, so <laughs> I'm messing with y'all. It's part of my turf. Um, so my mom and dad met in Seattle, Washington. They got married when uh, they were seniors in high school. Uh, my mom grew up in a very uh, abusive home, physically, sexually, emotionally. And my dad rescued her from that life and instantly fell into drug addiction and alcoholism. <laughs> and uh, my dad was a drug dealer um, in the 70s. He had a perm and a big mustache and sold drugs, sold dope. And him and my mom basically drank themselves away every day. I have an older brother and an older sister that were born into a house of addiction. And um, then something happened in the 70s called the Jesus People Movement. And the Jesus People Movement was unconventional. It was hippies not wearing shoes going into church and like they all smelled like patchouli and weed and like just go in and they were like we love Jesus we want to love Jesus they'd sit around playing acoustic guitars singing Maranatha songs and Kumbaya and all that well my mom and dad got pregnant again they weren't planning on having any more children and then um it was a long cold winter <laughs> and uh they got invited to my aunt and uncle's uh, apartment uh, when they were visiting some family in North Dakota, and they were having a home group meeting. Any of you all ever walk into the wrong church? Maybe to, for you, that's today. Um, but you walk, you walk into a church, you get in there, and you're like, oh, snap, these are the crazy people. Like, this is the weird place where they talk weird and they look weird. Um, that's what they walked into. They walked into a room where they were uh, speaking in tongues. My mom and dad, being drug dealers and drug addicts, and with Lutheran roots, didn't understand what this was. And uh, so they left, and my aunt and uncle came out, and they're like, no, it's in the Bible, it's in the book of Acts, like, it, you know, come in and just, we're safe, it's okay, and they're like, all right. And so the second they crossed the threshold, my mom and dad got slain in the Holy Ghost, got baptized, and before they asked Jesus into their heart, they got slain in the Holy Ghost, because Jesus saw the yes in their heart. As soon as they crossed that threshold, their lives changed. And so my mom and dad decided, well, we're going to be Christians now. We're going to... So they were instantly delivered from addiction, but they were not delivered from behavior. There is a difference. <laughs> you can be delivered instantly from addiction, but you still have a carnal thing. You have to walk out with the Holy Spirit, and it's only through the Holy Spirit that we can actually maintain sobriety and those things. And so my dad decided that he wanted to become a pastor. So they moved from Seattle to North Dakota. And I don't know why, um, other than to experience eight months of winter. <laughs> and they decided, the average temperature in North Dakota is negative 35. Yeah, it's brutal. Satan can't live there, it's too cold. <laughs> A lot of holy people up there. 
And so they moved up there and they started a non-denominational charismatic church, tongue talking. And this was now the 80s. Everything was seafoam green and peach. Like, it, you know, they're singing all these great songs like, as the deer panteth for the water, right? All these songs, you know, we had like, everybody had bedazzled flags and everybody had Star of David tambourines. And there is nothing worse than a church full of white people with tambourines. Let me just tell you something. It is not on beat. None of it is. It's a mess. It'll give you a stroke. And so I grew up in a spirit-filled church. I didn't really know much about Jesus. Um, I accepted Christ in the third grade. Um, Big crocodile tears. I watched our Sunday school teacher with a little felt board and the little Jesus cut out and showing how Jesus died for my sins. And I received Christ at probably the most authentic moment in my life, praying the most authentic prayer a third grader can pray. And I let Jesus move into my heart at, at, at third grade. But I didn't realize, um, I didn't really let Jesus move into my heart. I let my church move into my heart. What I mean by that is I learned less and less what Jesus was about, and I learned more and more about how not to make Christians in church angry. I learned how to navigate expectation from people that were hard to be around instead of what Jesus wanted. I knew that the church didn't want me to do certain things because it made me a naughty boy. But I didn't know what Jesus wanted. I didn't know why Jesus wanted me to be healthy. But I started going to Bible camp. Y'all have Bible camps here? Any of you go to Bible camp as a kid? So up in North Dakota, we had a Bible camp. My church was too broke, too little, and too poor. And so we would go to the Assemblies of God Church in town, and we would hitch a ride with them to Bible camp. And uh, we got along pretty well with them. Um, But our Bible camp was in Devil's Lake, North Dakota, (laughs) which is weird. Um, When I was in sixth grade, I went to, to Devil's Lake. And um, I got filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time in my life, which is a weird thing to say that you got filled by the Spirit in Devil's Lake. It sounds like a a Netflix horror movie is what it sounds like. (laughs) But um, that year, you know, growing up in North Dakota, I was surrounded by white people. We didn't have a lot of ethnicity, not a lot of culture, just a lot of Norwegians. And so uh, the only black people I saw or people of color were on TV. So I'd watch A Different World, right? I'd watch The Cosby Show. And, and like, I, that, that's the first time I was, ever saw anybody ethnic was on TV. And then I show up at Bible camp, sixth grade, and our speaker that year was a guy named Reggie Dabbs. Okay, and for those of you who don't know Reggie Dabbs, he's a really awesome evangelist. He's a black dude. And so I get off my bus, this little white boy from North Dakota, and I run towards the black guy. And I'm like, hello. <laughs> and I followed him around everywhere at camp. And I'd be like, can I carry your Bible? And he's like... Yeah, like, and I was this little chubby kid that looked like Fred Savage from the Wonder Years. Like, I had hair at one time. It is curly. And I would follow him around. I was like a white shadow. We were like an eclipse in walking around Bible camp. And uh, I just thought the world of him. I was like, he's neat, right? And uh, he didn't get annoyed and go like, man, why is this fat little white kid following me around? He was like, he would speak over me as I would walk. I would meet him at his cabin every morning and be like, hello, Reggie. Can I carry your Bible? And so I'd carry it to the chapel and he'd be like, you're going to be a world changer. You're going to trans, God's going to use you to transform the planet. He would speak life over me as we would, as I would annoy him and he would hide it. And I remember going through different phases, having real encounters with God. Encounters won't change you. Just because God rescued you one time when you were neck deep in trouble doesn't mean you're going to change. Most of us learn to do hostage negotiation prayers. You all know what I'm talking about? Lord, if that test comes back negative, I promise you I will serve you. Oh, I'm the only one up in this house? I doubt it. I saw some of y'all Instagrams last night, Saturday night. We hostage negotiate in prayer. We're like, God, if you just pay my rent this time, I promise I won't watch that movie again. I won't listen. I burned so many CDs and tapes as a kid. Every summer camp, I got saved. (laughs) Surely he's not strong enough to stay inside me. We get weird ideas about Jesus. 
Easter reminds me, Easter's my jam, dude. I love Easter. Growing up as a kid in church, put on my little plaid vest and my bow tie. Come on, y'all. Celebrate a Jewish rabbi by eating ham. Just food for thought. <laughs> but growing up having real encounters, I had real encounters. I got slain in the Holy Ghost, had visions as a kid, knew things about people, could prophesy since I was a kid. I thought everybody heard God the same way. I didn't know why people struggled with it. I'd be like, he's real. You didn't hear what he just said? And they're like, no. I'm like, oh, it's just me. But I had real encounters, but encounters never kept me. I didn't know who I was. And we always look to the world to tell us who we are. We don't really look to God. We don't really look to God to tell us who we are. But that's where our identity comes from, is the Father. But we get in trouble, and we wind up following Christian fanfare instead of Jesus. And we settle for rules instead of relationship. And it's easier to follow the rules because rules don't require intimacy. Rules don't require you to get real. The one thing I learned about Jesus is that he's ride or die. He's down for whatever. He's in your life. He's, he doesn't get nervous when you sin and go, ew, I'm backing off. He's the only God that crawls into our mess with us to pull us out. He never gives up on it. It says, even if you make your bed in hell, I'm there with you. But the problem is we get hurt by people and we punish Jesus for it. He's going, why are you yelling at me? We're like, somebody hurt my feelings. I'm never going to church again. And he's like, that's dumb. He's like, I love you. Why are you punishing me? Because somebody was dumb and rude to you. Guess what? If you ain't been hurt in church, you ain't got a pulse. You're welcome. So I didn't know who I was. And the church didn't tell me. The church didn't step up and go, hey, as a young person, this is who you are in Christ Jesus. They were just managing church culture. And I don't blame them. They were doing the best they knew how. But I was trying to figure out who I was. In the ninth grade, I decided I was going to be a cowboy. <laughs> Bought a pair of Durango cowboy boots, Levi's, silk shirt, and a lariat tie. I bought every Garth Brooks tape that came out. I had a poster on my wall of him roping the wind. I wasn't allowed to really listen to his music, but I could have his posters. And so I would hide his music in my room when my parents would leave. I'd blare it on my ghetto blaster. Listening to Garth Brooks, got myself a country western girlfriend. And I was like, this is going to be my life. I'm going to be a cowboy. It's going to be it. Go out riding horses with my country western girlfriend. Family owned a dairy farm. This is going to be... <laughs> Simon. So, so I figured this was going to be my life. And then I'm laying on my parents' floor watching TV. The old school TV, you got to get up to change the knob. And I'm, I'm laying on my stomach watching TV, and this brand new TV show comes on. Never been on before. This is the theme music to it. In living color. <laughs> and I was like, it's, right, it's a Wayne's Brothers production, right? It's urban comedy, and that's how white people say it's black comedy. It's urban comedy. It's like Black Saturday Night Live. It's where Jim Carrey got his start as well. Jennifer Lopez was a fly girl. That's where she got her start on there. And so I'm, I'm watching. I still remember the first group I saw on there was Wu-Tang. <laughs> Wu-Tang and A Tribe Called Quest uh, it was the first group I saw on there. It was A Tribe Called Quest, actually. And Tribe Called Quest, you know, uh, Buster Rhymes is up there, and he's like, what's the scenario? You know, and I'm like, yes. Like, this is it. I am not a cowboy. And I threw away all my country western clothes, and I went and started buying, like, oversized dickies, the big long braided belt like wearing it down to there <laughs> I started wearing shirts that said love see no color I bought a Malcolm X hat do you know how offended he would be that I'm wearing a Malcolm X hat but I was like no I bought the bib overalls and rocked one side down right you know what I'm talking about I was uh, sometimes I'd put them on backwards right because I was crossed out right because y'all know Criss Cross will make you, yeah, yeah, my people, my tribe right here. That was it. And I thought, like, this is going to be my life. So I started buying notebooks, and I was like, I'm going to be a gangster. And I was like, this is it. I'm going to be a gangster, daddy. I'm going to be a gangster. My dad's like, Luke, um, you're already short, and then you're wearing these giant pants. You, I looked like a gangster Oompa Loompa is what I looked like. And... 
so this was going to be my life. I was going to be a rapper. And we had the state fair that year, and I went and I won a prize at the balloon popping contest. And they said, pick your prize. And there was a big gold Wu-Tang necklace. And I picked that. I was like, up from the 36 chambers, right? And I was like, Wu-Tang, the RZA. And I was like, this is going to be my life. I was the original Eminem, the original White Rabbit. So I broke up with my country western girlfriend, started dating a girl from the airbase. Big old gold earrings, big hoops. Didn't take sass from nobody. And I was like, yeah, that's my girl. <laughs> then my brother-in-law, years later, was like, hey, I want to take you to an underground punk rock concert. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, just come with me. So I show up wearing my original Looney Tunes t-shirt. Thank you. Tasmanian devil dressed up like a gangster. My big saggy pants, my color me bad hat. And I went to this concert and I remember we got there and it was in the warehouse district and he opened this big metal door and it was just darkness going into this little warm light and all I heard out of the basement was and I was like, we found hell. <laughs> like my dad was right, like it's here. And like we walked into the basement and all I saw was mohawks, multicolored hair, piercings and tattoos and and I was just like what is this like does my dad know you brought me here like this is crazy and then I saw something that spoke to me on a primitive level I saw these bodies moving in a big circle right it's called a mosh pit and I was like I want that and like I jumped into the mosh pit 30 seconds later pooped out the other side of it Broken necklace, pants around my ankles, busted lip, can't find my color me bad hat. And I was hooked. I kept all the rap music and decided I was going to be a punk rocker, though. Trying to figure out who I would be. Constantly looking to the world to tell me instead of God thinking, well, God's upset with me anyways. I annoy him. I frustrate him. I'm sure he's keeping score. I don't make him happy. I fail all the time. And most Christians learn to lead a double life. One where we're on display in front of people, where we wear the mask. The only problem with that is when you wear a mask, your mask is the only thing that gets any love. You're starving to death under that mask because people will reject you for being broken. People will reject you for having weird desires and issues. But what if I told you that God was a safe place to fail? What if I told you that he died so you could die too? That he resurrected so you could get up again too? But I didn't understand this complexity. I just didn't know who I was. So I turned 18 and I was like, I'm a man now. It's time to move out the house because I'm a man now. So I got a job at Taco Bell. Yeah. Started slinging them tacos, y'all. Yeah. Now, I had a big orange mohawk. I had piercings. My labret was pierced. I was stretching out my ears, gauging out my ears. And everybody that worked at this Taco Bell was a punk rocker. I don't know why they hired us, but that's all they hired was us punk rockers. The dude making tacos has leopard print spikes all over his head. Like, we looked like out-of-work circus clowns is what we looked like. <laughs> People would come in and be like, yeah, I'll have the number. No, thank you. No. <laughs> I'm playing in a punk band. My punk band's starting to get pretty well-known. We're starting to travel now. I'm working part-time and traveling and playing festivals. And we start playing things like Vans Warped Tour. And we start experiencing success. And, and my punk band's doing pretty good. And, but I'm still working this job. And we're not being paid by Vans Warped Tour to go out. We paid our own way. And we're like on the 15th stage facing a cornfield, <laughs> sleeping in a van down by the river. <laughs> For those of you from the 90s. And so this was my life. And I had a man come into, uh, taco, or into, uh, into the taco shop and he said, listen, you played at my club the other night and I want to hire you. And I was like, for what? And he goes, I want you to be the mouthpiece for my security detail at this nightclub, this Colombian gentleman. And I said, okay, anything was better than making tacos for minimum wage. So I took the job. I went to his nightclub and started working. And I started noticing drugs being passed around and people using, going into the bathroom and people are doing coke off the sink and all this stuff. And I'm turning a blind eye because I'm being paid to be there. And I got something working at this nightclub that I never got at church, a sense of purpose. I got respect because of who I was associated with. I never got that in church. See, Satan will offer you a really great copy of the thing that, the need that's not being met. And right now in our lives, we have unmet needs 
And because we're not comfortable with Jesus, we outsource those needs to bad things. Take him to Jesus. He can take it. Whatever your issue is, don't outsource it. Take it to him. He can help you. He's not going to give up on you or look at you and go, gross, I don't want you. He made you. He loves you. So I'm working at this nightclub, and I discover a drug called Vicodin. And um, my boss says, look, this nightclub is a front for a drug operation. We bring drugs in through Canada, through the Canadian border, and we distribute them throughout the U.S. We take them down to Houston to a place in Fifth Ward called Cutter's Row. 80% of the drugs in America are cut in Houston and distributed at Cutter's Row in Fifth Ward and Fourth Ward. And um, he said, look, I want you to work with my debt collection team. I don't want you to be with security anymore. When people owe me product or money, I want you and Mike and Steve, Big Mike and Big Steve, to go and collect the debt that's owed. I'm not going to get into all the details of that. I don't believe in glorifying darkness. Okay, but I will tell you this. It was a very bad time in my life. Being addicted to Vicodin, eating 40 pills a day, 500 milligram tabs, eating a hole through my stomach with these painkillers, bleeding internally, and torturing people that owed my boss product or money. Um, one day, Mike and Steve picked me up and they said, hey, this kid stole two pounds of weed from us. Uh, we got to go pay him a visit. And so I start realizing we're driving into my parents' neighborhood. We're two houses down from my mom and dad, and it's my childhood friend whose mother was a prostitute growing up. He was molested by every strange man that came into his home. And I knew his story. I knew his life. Mike and Steve said, uh, we got to go pay him a visit. I couldn't do it. I peaced out. I said, I can't. This is two houses down from my mom and dad, and I know this kid too, much, too well. They let me go. They went in, and they tortured him for six and a half hours. And thought he was going to die anyway, so they shot him with a 45. They thought he died. And Aaron was his name. Aaron lived and crawled to a phone and called 911. And he made it. And Mike and Steve went to jail for attempted murder, which got the FBI's attention. So we started noticing things like black vans parked outside of our apartments, parked outside the nightclub. And I knew... I could hear from God even when I was running from God. Even when I was drinking, sleeping around, using drugs, I could hear God. I could hear the Holy Spirit. There'd be times I'd be dealing eight balls and he'd say, get out of the house, and I'd leave. I'd tell people, we need to leave. They wouldn't listen. A meth lab blew up and killed people in the house. That'll mess with your grace. FBI shows up. Starts talking to my boss, but I don't know about it. I have a dream. And in the dream, I'm visited by a small Hispanic girl dressed like a nun. And in the dream, she says, you need to tell Carl that you quit. That's what she said in the dream. I woke up and I was like, that's weird. I thought maybe I just ate something funny before I went to bed. And then I go to work the next day to Carl, and I cannot shake the dream. And I say, Carl, I need to quit. Now, I don't know if the drug industry has touched any of y'all's lives, but you don't get to turn in a two weeks notice. You don't get to go to your boss and go, it's been great working here. Fantastic. I've really built my portfolio. If you could write me a letter of reference, I would appreciate it. I've learned to sell very well. Um, and any, any, sort of, uh, any sort of plan would be great. You don't get to do that. And I told Carl, who was a superstitious Catholic, Carl, I need to quit. God told me. Carl stood up and looked at me and he said, too bad. I'm never letting you go. See, because I brought favor on Carl. Because I still believed in God. It's not like I didn't believe in God. I was just running from him. I wasn't living the life I was supposed to be living. I was running from God. And even running from God, I brought favor. And so I told Carl, the little girl told me her name in the dream. Her name was Maria. And I said, Maria would have wanted it this way. And I watched this Colombian dude turn white as a sheet. And he looks at me and he goes, what did you say? I said, Maria would have wanted it this way. And he screamed at me and he said, get out. I never want to see you again. So what I didn't know was the night before, Carl had turned state's evidence with the FBI. And he was rolling over on everybody, giving everybody else up for a shortened sentence. And the only two people he didn't turn in were me and one other guy, and we both became ministers. Carl went to prison and got radically saved in prison and now leads a, a men's Bible study in Seattle. <laughs> he called me, and he was like, do you know why I yelled at you and said I never want to see you again? I was like, no. 
he said, I had a little sister who died when she was 10 and her name was Maria and she wanted to be a missionary. He said, no one knew about that. Only God could have told you. So I didn't sober up. I stayed lost in drug addiction, trying to figure out who I was. I moved to a bigger city, playing in nightclubs and bars with my bands, feeling like this was the only way I could be successful. In, in school, I was diagnosed learning disabled and ADHD. And now this was the 80s and 90s. It's not like it is now. Back then in the 80s and 90s, I was tied to my desk, tied to chairs, told I was retarded, beat by teachers, put in special needs classes, literally going to school alongside people with Down syndrome, put in special needs classes saying that's where you belong, being told I would never amount to anything, that I could never go to college and never become anything great. And the church didn't fill in that void. It was business as usual. So I'm looking for a job in this new big city because my band isn't making enough to pay rent. So I get a job at a head shop. You all know what a head shop is? Oh, well, somebody does. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> so I got a job at a head shop where there's a tattoo shop, a skateboard shop, sold vinyl records. We sold bongs, pezzo pipes for burning oil, but that's really for smoking crack. Um, and so, you know, we'd sell products to get drugs out of your system, all that kind of stuff. And I'm working there. It's called discontent. That's the name of the business. That's where I got hired. So I'm working one day. I'm selling Vicodin in the bathroom. And I'm working one day, and I don't have time for a lunch break, so I run across the street, get some food, bring it back, eat it behind the counter. The next day, the owner calls me and says, bro, you're fired. And I was like, I'm fired? He's like, yep, it's unprofessional. You can't eat behind the counter. I was like, we sell crack pipes. Like, that's... So I got fired. Got a job working at Walmart, rocking that blue vest, unloading semi-trucks from 11 p.m. till 7 a.m., my parents came over one morning. They surprised me. I didn't live in the same city. They called me. I would go nine months without talking to my parents. They called me. And I'm like, hello? And they're like, hey, um, we want to see you. And I was like, that's cool. They're like, we're in town. You're in town now, like today? And they're like, yep. I'm like, okay, okay. And they're like, we have a surprise. And I was like, what is it? I had a sleepover the night before and I didn't have a chance to hide anything. I had adult movies on the ground, empty pill bottles, empty alcohol bottles. I had no time to clean anything up. I opened the door and let him in and I watched this look wash over my mom and dad's face. And I looked at my mom and I said, your baby boy is still in here. This isn't me. I'm just, uh, this isn't who I am. I know that there's better things. I know that I know that I know I have a destiny. I just I'm not ready yet. My mom and dad left. They said that night my mom prayed the most dangerous prayer a mom can pray. She said, "God, I give you permission to do whatever it takes." That next night I'm working at Walmart and I'm visited by an angel. I didn't believe in angels. I didn't believe in any of that stuff. I thought that it was just Bible stories of shepherds smoking peyote in a field. Basically the Cheech and Chong of the Bible. Like, brah, an angel, brah. You know, like, that's it. I didn't believe in it. But yet here I am face to face with a nine foot tall dude that's two dimensional and three dimensional, speaks in three octaves all at the same time, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he said, when are you coming home? And I turned away from him because I knew that I didn't have to listen to him. I knew enough about the Bible that I could turn my back. He said, God's waiting for you. And then he was gone. The next night we had a sold out concert. I invited this girl I met at the bar the night before, this redhead. We had started dating and I was like, um, come to my concert, it's sold out. I'll get you in though, I'll put you on the list. So she came in and we, I strummed the first note and my guitar falls off and I fall off the stage face first because my heart stops beating. Whole crowd clears, she comes over, starts massaging my heart for probably 45 minutes, the show's over. My bandmates left the stage because we had free alcohol all night long. And so they left to go drink because they knew I was a drug addict and hopeless. 
And really all my life, all I really wanted was for God to be proud of me. All I really wanted was for my mom and dad and God to be proud of me. I wanted to be enough. I was never enough for any girl I dated. I was never enough for anybody in my family. I was never enough for any teacher. I was never good enough for anybody. And my whole Christian walk became about keeping God pleased instead of understanding that he was already pleased. 45 minutes I'm laying on that ground. She helps me up and she takes me to the roof of this club. Probably another 30 minutes I'm up there with her. She says, my mom's a nurse. I'm going to take you across the street. She takes me across the street to the hospital called Mercy Care. I walk in, my mohawk's limp, my mascara's running. I was a gutter punk. I wore black lipstick, black eyeliner, black fingernail polish. And I come walking in the emergency room. Something's wrong with my heart. And the nurses said, do you have insurance? And I said, no. And they said, fill out all these forms. So I'm filling out forms, convulsing. And they hook a blood pressure monitor up to me and an alarm goes off and they're like, oh, you're not doing well. And so they wheel me back to surgery. And the nurse turns to the doctor, the surgeon in the room and says, we're going to lose him. And I said, I can hear you. <laughs> and so they hooked me up to this machine. They're getting an IV started in my arm to slow my heart down. My heart was beating at 244 beats per minute for almost two hours by this point. So they were able to slow my heart rate down with this fluid that went to my heart and they had to schedule me for a six and a half hour heart surgery. And I'm laying there in recovery before the surgery, after they stabilized me, I should say, not recovery, but they stabilized me. The redhead comes walking into the ER. She's like, hey baby, I gotta go to work. If I'm late once, I'm fired. And so I just wanted to see that you were alive. And I was like, yeah, this is a really good first date. She said, um, I was giving good thoughts towards you. And I said, what, what does that mean? Are you a Christian? And she said, no, I'm a witch. And I was like, oh, okay. And she's like, oh, not like that. I'm a good witch. And I was like, yeah, okay. And I said, what do you do for a living? And she said, I'm a stripper. And she said, if I'm late, I'm fired. So I got to go. She left and my stomach sank. I was like, that's like in the pastor's kids manual, page one, chapter one don't date stripper witches. It's like the first, it's the first sentence in there. Don't do it. So I start crying. I lose it. And I have an open vision, which is like a movie playing right in front of your face. And Jesus comes out of the ceiling on his side, just like the same Jesus I saw on the felt board in Sunday school in the third grade. And to tell you that he is kind is a really bad understatement. Jesus is not loving or kind. He's the definition of love. He's the definition of kindness. Like they find their definition in him. And my first thought when I saw Jesus was, first of all, I thought I was dying, to be honest, because I'm like, I'm seeing Jesus, that he's here to take me home or to hell. <laughs> my first thought was, what did I just spend seven years running from? Because when I saw him, it was the first time I felt loved. It's the first time I felt like I was enough for somebody else. It was the first time I didn't feel dirty. I was running from the wrong Jesus for seven years. I was running from a religious, performance-based Jesus for seven years. Not even the real Jesus. He said, I have too much for you to do for you to live this way. Give me your life. He said, I'll give you two choices. You can die or you can live. And when he said the word live, I saw two pictures. One of a short Asian woman in a wedding dress, in a Michael Jackson t-shirt wedding dress. Super weird. Second, a baby girl in a birthing unit. So I knew if I lived, I would have a wife who loved me and I would have a daughter. And I went through a six and a half hour heart surgery, called my parents and said, can I move home? Went through withdrawal, went through sobriety, got surrounded by Christians. Seven years later, across a crowded room in Houston, Texas, I see the Asian girl from my vision. And she's wearing a Michael Jackson Beat It t-shirt. And I'm like, that's my clue. The Holy Spirit's like, I need to help you with a context clue or you'll miss it. <laughs> my wife's name is Grace. And I sat her down 
on our third date and told her every awful thing I had ever done to anybody else because the Holy Spirit told me to tell her and I didn't want to. You know what's scary? You have those conversations with somebody you're dating. You're like, okay, what have you done? Don't be so holy. I know you have those conversations. We're like, okay, where, what's your history? You know, what, what's your background? I want to make sure I can handle it. So the Holy Spirit said, don't let her fall in love with you until she knows your story. Because otherwise it's manipulation. So I told her on our third date, things I would never share from this pulpit. And she sat there crying for 20 minutes. I told her in a park in Houston. And I told her, I said, it, she's a good girl. She waited for marriage. She was God-fearing, God-loving, never strayed. And I looked at her and I said, it's okay. I know that I'm broken. I know that I'm too much. I know I'm way dirtier and awful. Like you could have such a good godly dude. You could have such an amazing godly man. Like it's okay. Stand up and give me the Christian girl hug. It's okay. I get it. And she looks up at me with these big brown eyes and tears rolling down her face. And she said, I'm the luckiest girl in the whole world. And I asked her to marry me there three months later at that same spot. Doctor said we would never have a child. For four years we tried. Lost a pregnancy. And then conceived. My daughter next month turns nine. God has given me back so much. And I'll tell you what, in the last 18 years of full-time traveling ministry, we've led over 30,000 to Christ under our ministry. We've had over 10,000 prodigals rededicate their lives and come home to the Lord. We've led over 2,000 Muslims in the last two years to Christ in our ministry. I've received favor from God. A learning disabled kid that was told he was too mentally handicapped to ever spell well <laughs> is now a Barnes & Noble record-breaking author. That's not because I'm great. That's because God did something great through a simple vessel. That's it. But this is what I want to read to you today. Romans 5, 6. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The most amazing thing about my testimony is not the darkness, not, where, not all the jacked up stuff I came through. It's where I'm headed. It's what, he, it's what God has added to me since I returned to him, since I came back to him. And listen, some of you have led a Christian life that has been nothing but hype. You've loved Jesus like you loved Nike, like you loved Jordan, like you loved that meal, whatever it is. We've lost the power of what it means to love something and to really know something. Some of us thought we were friends, but we were really just acquaintances. Acquaintance is defined as knowledge as a result of study. Do you know Jesus from hearing about him or from experiencing him? The real Jesus may not feel super comfortable in modern church. And we've lost a lot of generations because we've forced them into something that wasn't good. We forced them into culture and not into the man Jesus. I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads. This is your opportunity this morning. I'm coming at you with something real this morning. Because serving Jesus is not easy. It is difficult, it's messy, it's complicated, and it's sacrificial, but it is the most beautiful and profound thing you can ever do with your life. He saved you from hell on Calvary. That's true. But it wasn't hell that drove Jesus to the cross. It wasn't your bad behavior. It was love that drove him to the cross. It was because he wanted to love you. Some of you have become cynical and hard to be around because you hate religion so much because you've been abused by it. And God wants to push delete for you this morning and give you the opportunity to reset and start over.